What I'm going to do is to present more or less the observed facts about global warming from a sort of global perspective and then there will be another talk on the projections into the future using models and we'll kind of go from there. I think a lot of this is very basic material. You may already know but uh, it's important to go through it and these are things that you can put out there as very well known, uh, very well known facts at this point from a scientific uh, perspective. I think I had this upside down. So, what do we know for sure? Greenhouse gases are increasing rapidly in the atmosphere and this is happening because of uh, human activities mostly because of the exploitation or the combustion of fossil fuels and if we keep going at the rate we're going we could increase the CO2 in the atmosphere by a factor of four taking it to a condition it has not been in for tens of millions of years. Right? So it's a huge thing on a geological kind of scale the primary greenhouse gas is CO2 and there was a little bit of a historic event if you like round numbers that happened this year. Just on May 9th uh, CO2 measured at Mauna Loa Observatory which is shown on the right there reached uh, a level of 400 parts per million which is about 40 percent more than it was say in 1750 or some time that might, you might choose to define the beginning of the industrial uh, revolution. So this is a huge change in the composition uh, of the atmosphere which has been very precisely uh, measured and you can go back into the geologic past using bubbles trapped in ice cores and measure the concentration of CO2 trapped in bubbles in ice cores and you can see that for, from 400,000 years ago, this actually goes back farther than that, but from 400,000 years ago to the present there has been an up and down in the carbon dioxide concentration associated with the succession of ice ages that happened over that period. But now, uh, as you can see on the right hand side here, we're increasing the CO2 at a rate and above values that haven't been observed for millions of years. So uh, it's a rather big change in the composition of the atmosphere. And we know uh, from like a CSI science kind of perspective that it's humans who are uh, increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere. And how I have a list here of the argument for carbon-13 that you can read yourself. But for carbon there are two really stable isotopes, carbon-12 carbon which is the most common one and carbon-13 which is slightly heavier, it has an extra proton. So if you're a tree or some sort of plant and you're growing and you're taking CO2 through the pores of your leaves to form cellulose to help you to grow, right? That's what you do as a plant. While you're doing that, you much prefer the lighter isotope. So the composition of your structure as a tree is light in carbon-13. It's light, isotopically light, more carbon-12. So uh, if you lived in the deep dark, deep, deep dark past, you might live in a swamp, you would die at some point, a couple million years later you're coal and your material that's previously been a plant so you're isotopically light, not so much carbon-13. Then uh, in a few hundred years you get dug up by humans and burned and then the carbon that was formerly in your tissue goes into the atmosphere and it makes the atmosphere isotopically more light. So we know for certain beyond any reasonable doubt that the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is coming from fossil fuel combustion. So here's a plot from uh, actually Tasmania showing the carbon-13 decreasing in the atmosphere in consequence of fossil fuel burning and you can also observe the oxygen concentration. We have instruments that are so precise now that we can measure very, very tiny decreases in the O2 in the atmosphere. So if you burn carbon in the atmosphere, you need two oxygens to do it, right? So you take an O2 from the atmosphere and you turn it into CO2. So the oxygen in the atmosphere is also going down as a consequence of fossil fuel burning. So there are many uh, diagnostics that are very robust that we can use to show that the CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing because of fossil fuel burning primarily. We also understand the uh, physics of radiative transfer in the atmosphere very, very well. This is a 
sort of a classic plot of the energy balance of the atmosphere. The sun puts about 340 watts per meter squared, globally averaged day and night. So that's like three and a half hundred watt light bulbs, globally averaged. Of course, on a June day, it's more than that. It's more like 14 uh, 100 watt light bulbs. But if you average it over the whole Earth, it's about 340. About half of that gets to the surface. Some of it's reflected uh, and some of it's absorbed in the atmosphere. So you get about 160 heating the ground, but the amount that you're getting from the atmosphere is more than twice that, right? So infrared radiation is radiated downward from the atmosphere and heats the surface. Otherwise, it would freeze every night. So the greenhouse effect is very important for maintaining the surface temperature of the Earth, and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are extremely important for that. It's primarily water vapor, but CO2 is sort of the base ingredient of maintaining the uh, greenhouse effect. So you can, you can calculate what we call uh, the forcing of climate change. If you take that increase in carbon dioxide, you can translate it into watts per meter squared, doing a fairly robust calculation. So you can translate that increase in CO2 into a forcing for warming. And then the Earth has to warm up enough so that what it, it, what it emits to space equals what's being trapped by uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases. The other thing uh, we're pretty sure about uh, is that the Earth is getting warming, warmer. And we have multiple independent data sets that indicate that this is so. Right? We have land air temperature, which is measured in the Stevenson screen kind of boxes that look like that. We have uh, sea surface temperature that in the deep dark past was measured with buckets. Now it's measured with ship intakes or with buoys. We know that the air temperature uh, uh, in the, uh, above the surface in, is increasing. We have thermometers on balloons and we have satellites in space. We know that the ocean heat content uh, is increasing. The temperature at depth in the ocean is also increasing. We know that land ice is melting, we know that sea ice is melting, and we know that the sea level is rising. So the Earth is definitely getting warmer. Is that warming unusual? Is it something that humans are doing, or is it a natural uh, variation? That is the question of attribution, detection attribution. So we have, uh, at the present time, three data sets that try to estimate the global mean temperature over land and ocean. One of them is from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, the US, one is the Hadley Center in Britain, and the third is from uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies in New York City. And this is a plot from 1900 to 2012 of a global average surface temperature from the MLOST data set. And the red line is a, a fit to the whole uh, data set. And you can see that there are some interesting kinks in this time series. It increases pretty rapidly from 1900 to about 1940, and then it's kind of flat for a while until about 1980, and then it increases again rapidly. And the thing that you've probably been hearing a lot about lately is what some people call the hiatus. Since about 1998, when there was a major El Nino and the Earth was very, very warm, the temperature stayed roughly, uh, roughly level. Uh, if you... Uh, decompose that a little bit more and look at the trends in the northern hemisphere winter half year from October to May, March and you compare that with April to September you get the impression that the hiatus is mostly a northern hemisphere winter time phenomenon uh, which is plotted on the left here and if you look at the right it looks like uh, you can interpret this if you want to you can interpret it in many ways of course that this red line, which is the uh, fit to the entire data set, is sort of going up steadily. And then about in 1998, there's a jump. And then the summertime, at least, appears to be increasing at roughly the same rate as the uh, uh, overall trend for the past century. So I think the, there are several possible explanations for the hiatus. The most likely one is natural variability, the rate at which the ocean takes up heat from the atmosphere, varies with time because of variations in the ocean circulation. But that's one of the hot topics, I think, right now in uh, climate research is try to understand 
why the rate of uh, warming has apparently leveled off since about 1998. Of course, you're all very familiar with the Arctic sea ice trend, which has been very dramatic over the past uh, 20 or 30 years, particularly uh, 2012 was a record. September 16th, uh, 2012 was a minimum of 1.32 million square kilometers, and the maximum is around 14. So uh, that's been a fairly dramatic change. Uh, some likelihood that that's related to global warming. There's maybe also a component of natural variability in that. So then we come to the issue of detection and attribution, which I attribution, which I introduced early uh, inter inadvertently there. So detection is saying there has been warming and it's beyond what I would expect from natural variability. Attribution is to say that warming is due to human activities, not to natural variability. And since about uh, AR3, I think, or so, about 2001, the IPCC process has been saying that warming, uh, the recent warming is associated with uh, human activities. So warming of the Earth is unequivocal, and it's very likely that most of the warming since the mid-20th century is, uh, is due to humans, particularly to greenhouse gases. And the AR4 in 2007 made this uh, statement, which are the formal words to uh, support that general uh, point of view. That uh, detection attribution argument is based on figures that look like this. So that's the global mean temperature as a function of time. The black line is the observations which I showed you previously, suitably smooth. And the blue line is the range of temperatures that you get from just natural variability, volcanoes, solar, <coughs> the internal variability of the ocean. And the pink uh, band is what you get if you add human forcing. And the fact that these, uh, the blue area and the pink area separate in about 1980 or so is indicating that you have detected and a change that's beyond natural vari variability and you've associated it with human forcing of the climate. Of course, it depends on your confidence in the global mean climate models, which Luann's going to talk about uh, next, to make that attribution. And uh, you can also do this not only for the global mean, but also for the land area, the ocean area, and uh, a number of relatively large geographical areas, such as uh, North America, South America, et cetera. Right? So that's the uh, scientific argument. We go into a, a little bit more detail. Uh, moisture in the atmosphere. Moisture in the atmosphere is really important. It's been humid lately. I think Nick's going to mention that here. But moisture in the atmosphere is what drives storms. Uh, cause, you know, the rain comes from moisture in the atmosphere. One of the basic laws of physics, which is as certain as Newton's laws of gravity, is that if you have um, a surface of water at a certain temperature, the humidity the concentration of water vapor in the air next to that surface increases exponentially with temperature. Right? So the water vapor in the atmosphere increases very rapidly with the temperature of the ocean. It's called the Clausius-Clapeyron law. And the proportionality is really high. Uh, if you increase the surface temperature by one degree Celsius, the so-called saturation specific humidity increases by 7%. It's one of the reasons people think that tropical storms will get much more intense uh, in a warmed climate because there'll be more latent energy in the surface air. That hasn't actually been observed yet with uh, great certainty, but that's the, one of the speculations about uh, what might happen in a warmed uh, earth. Right? So it's warmed about six tenths of a degree Celsius since about uh, 19, 75 or 50 or something like that, and that would be 4% increase in the water vapor of the atmosphere that we should expect to see, right? And if you, if you measure the uh, surface specific humidity uh, over land or ocean between 1975 and the present, that's about what you see, is about a 4% increase in the humidity of the air. And of course, water vapor is the most important uh, greenhouse gas. So what about observed changes in extremes? Extremes are by definition rare events. 
So it gets pretty hard to actually detect a change in extremes with a short record. But we can definitely say that cold nights and days have decreased and warm days and nights have increased. Uh, there's reasonable ev evidence of uh, when rain falls in North America, it rains harder. Some indications of strong, stronger tropical storms, at least in the Atlantic, but that evidence is a bit uh, the debatable droughts, extreme heat, observed evidence for change is still uncertain due to the quality of the records, particularly their shortness. Recently, the observation of ocean salinity has added a new element to the observed evidence for uh, global change. Uh, the saltiness of the ocean depends on the difference between evaporation and precipitation. If it rains more than it evaporates, then the ocean surface will be relatively fresh. If it evaporates more than it precipitates, like the Dead Sea or the Mediterranean, then the surface will be very, very uh, salty. Right? And there has been an observed trend in salinity that looks like the pattern of evaporation minus precipitation. So it's sort of arguing that the contrast between uh, dry areas and wet areas is increasing. And you can't actually see this if you look at observations of precipitation, but the salinity is of the ocean is an integrator of uh, precipitation minus evaporation, so the signal might be uh, more robust there. So this is a picture of precipitation minus evaporation. The red areas, for some reason, are the wetter ones in this particular plot. So in the subtropics where the trade winds are, the evaporation is greater than precipitation. Along the equator in the inter intertropical convergence zone here in the Western Pacific, there's much more precipitation than evaporation. So there will be a pattern in the salinity that you would expect with salty water here and fresh water there. And that's what you observe. If you look at the left-hand pattern here, it's a map of the climatology or the long-term average of salinity which is high in the subtropics in the Pacific, low, lower along the equator. The Atlantic is much saltier than the Pacific for a number of different reasons. Then, if, So that pattern can, corresponds to the evaporation minus the precipitation pattern. And then on the right is the calculation of the 50-year linear trend in salinity. And the pattern of that looks kind of like the climatology, right? So, but it's, it's noisy. So in the subtropics, it's getting saltier. In the Atlantic, it's getting saltier. Along the equator in the West Pacific, it's getting fresher. So it's like the uh, contrast in P minus E is increasing with time, which is one thing that the climate models predict. They say wet gets wetter, dry gets drier. So this would be maybe some kind of uh, evidence of that. And you can also see that salinity change if you look in the depth of the ocean. So this is from the surface to 2,000 meters under the ocean. This is the South Pole. Some fresh water that gets shoved down there. This contour is the climatology. It's saltier here. The colored patterns are the pattern of the trend, which is also matching up. So where the salinity is lower, it's getting less. Where the salinity is high, the trend is upward. This is a very interesting uh, observation of the ocean regarding to climate change. So to summarize uh, the science so far, the amount of long-lived greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is being dramatically increased by humans. The Earth is warming unequivocally, and we're pretty sure that's due to uh, human production of greenhouse gases. Two of the interesting things for the present time that you may not have heard emphasized before is the warming hiatus since about 1998, which is an interesting thing to try to explain, most likely due to natural variability. And then what I just showed you that we can observe this trend in the salinity, which is suggestive of something that the models have predicted might happen. Thank you very much.